Hello, I'm Jim Whaley. This week, Cinema Showcase comes to you from the USA Film Festival in Dallas, Texas. And my guest is the noted American filmmaker, Mr. Melvin Frank. His new film is the film version of Neil Simon's Prisoner of Second Avenue. So join me as I talk with Mel Frank on Cinema Showcase. Good evening, I'm Jim Whaley. Tonight, from the USA Film Festival in Dallas, my guest is the noted American filmmaker, Mr. Melvin Frank. His latest film, for Warner Brothers, stars Jack Lemmon and Anne Bancroft, and is The Prisoner of Second Avenue, based on the play by Neil Simon. We'll be talking about that film, and some of his other motion pictures as well. So join me tonight, as I talk with Mel Frank, on Cinema Showcase. Thank you very much for joining Cinema Showcase tonight. And Mel Frank, it's good to be here talking with you. Thank you, Jim. It's a great pleasure to be here. I first want to um, congratulate you on Prisoner of Second Avenue. The film, I think, is very funny, and I, I hope, and I'm sure it's going to be a big hit. Are you pleased with it? I'm extremely pleased with it. I'm also extremely pleased with the public reaction to it. Uh, I don't mean that to somebody who just made a film that might make a lot of money. I mean it as a film that uh, the critics have liked and the people who have seen it say to me the things that I wanted them to say before I made the picture. Yeah. That's, uh, that's always terribly important to feel that you've not only done something that uh, people enjoy, but that they, they enjoy it in the way in which you meant them to enjoy it. This is a drama, as you know, about real people in a very real situation. And I say drama because, um, as opposed to comedy, even though people laugh almost all the way throughout, is that we attacked it as if it were very serious material with very, very good... You can't get better actors than these two people. They're both Academy Award winners. Jack won his last year and won one once before, Mr. Roberts, and won hers for... Uh, forget, miracle Worker, that was what it was. And then she won a couple of Tony Awards and a couple of other things. So, um, I usually don't talk about the awards that my actors win, I, uh, win because that isn't that important to me. What is important is the fact that these are two people of enormous talent who have waited 25 years to work with each other. Each of them have privately told me uh, it's been their ambitions for 25 years to work together. And now that they have worked together, and you can see them up there on that great big screen, uh, you see what it's like. Uh, if I can interrupt myself for just a second, I loved what Arch Winston said in the New York uh, Post. He included me in it. I'm delighted to be included in that thing. But he said, it's great to see three pros working together. I couldn't be more thrilled than, than think that after 35 years of doing it, somebody considers me a professional. Uh, in fact, in a recent talk I had with Jack Lemmon, <clears throat> he said that he made a very sweeping statement. But coming from him, you know that he meant it. He said that um, to him, Ann Bancroft was just about the best actress he's ever worked with. No, uh, she's the best actor. Well, I shouldn't say that. I, I, She's one of the two best actresses I've ever worked with. The other one was Glenda Jackson, with whom I did a touch of class last year, Glenda and George. And it really was an incredible experience of going directly from working on that piece of material with Glenda Jackson and George Segal, to, uh, which, which had just been re-released, by the way, at a touch of class. And going from that picture to working with Jack Lemmon and Ann Bancroft in almost the same sort of working relationship it was wonderful because um, often actors almost expect you when you're a director to to behave like Cecil B. DeMille or <laughs> Von Sternberg, you know, have the boots and the megaphone so you go over here and you do that. That isn't the way we do it. We, 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 I, it it's true that as a director, I suppose I had to make a lot of the final creative decisions. And certainly long after the, my actors had left the 
scene and gone on to other things, I was left with a, that, that film that I had to put together, the long shots, the close shots, the, you know, all the thousands of little bits and pieces that go into making any picture, but those decisions, which ones are used, when you go into a close shot, when you come back, which take you use, uh, what color uh, you want the film printed, all, all that sort of stuff, those are the prerogatives and the, not only the privilege, but the duty of the director. But on the set, getting into the making of the picture, uh, it was incredible for me, incre inc incredible luck to have gone from that uh, amb ambiance of, 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 of collaboration that I had with uh, those three, those other two, to exactly the same thing here with these marvelous actors. I consider myself a very privileged and lucky man indeed, and I like to go on working with those four people. Yeah. Well, now in both of those films, um, working with Glenda Jackson and here with Anne Bancroft, Neither of the ladies, uh, however brilliantly gifted they are, have been particularly noted for comedic roles. Right. Well, now, I, I, I know what you're going to say, yeah. but I'm going to tell you right now that I can, I'm not going to claim credit for that, because uh, for the fact that they did come, as a matter of fact, Glenda Jackson won the Academy Award last year. She's the current Academy Award. No, oops, it's not the current. She was the current Academy Award winner until the new Academy yeah. Award. Right. I, uh, uh, but... Uh, um, the, the, what I was about to say was that the ability to do comedy is in a sense the ability to act, at least the kind of comedy that I want people to do, which isn't just a lot of takes and a lot of whatever it is. It's to take, you must have that special gift to be able to look at humanity and say, how can I portray this in a way that can make people laugh and perhaps cry and hopefully want to go to bed with me as well, and because <laughs> That, that's what that's what both of these ladies have, and that's what the greats did have years ago. It's amazing. You when you stop and think about it, that when I first went to Hollywood, there were you're too young, and most of your audience will be too young. But some of their fathers and mothers who might be looking in will remember people like Gene Arthur, uh, Claudette Colbert, Carol Lombard, uh, Loretta Young, uh, Rosalind Russell. Paul, did I say Paulette Goddard? I don't remember. Uh, but perhaps Catherine Hepburn, Irene Dunn, there were so many that were under contract to studios. I could go on and on and on. June Allison and uh, Ava Gardner, they all, and, and, and uh, who were some of the other ones that I worked with? Plenty, take my word for it. <clears throat> Lauren Bacall, Marilyn Monroe, people who could make you laugh in one film and make you cry in the next, and in some films make you do both, but always made themselves never lost their femininity, didn't become just clowns. They became, they never stopped being, and this is a naughty word now, sexual objects, women as sexual objects. Uh, they were always actresses to the core. Now, for some reason, we've lost that. We, there are, how many can you name in the last 10 years that have come up? You know, there was Shirley MacLaine, Barbara Streisand. Uh, that's about it. Audrey Hepburn came and went, but she'll be back, I'm sure. She's talented. But I mean, th these are just a hand, five or six ladies, you know, and we should have hundreds, because somewhere in these colleges around here, in these schools around here, there are lovely, pretty, and beautiful, and sexy young girls who can do this sort of thing. Well, don't we have because, because one of the reasons is that the whole system has changed. We've gone, we used to have studio operations. That was part of the studio expenditure. Mm -hmm. They'd get 150 girls a year, and they'd put them under contract, and if they got two Lana Turners or one Betty Grable out of them, that would pay for the whole lot. No, there's nobody to do that anymore. Most of the pictures, the motion picture studios, are merely um, big servicing companies who service independent producers, people like myself. I don't have the money to do it. Perhaps one day, if I have the energy and the strength, maybe, and the money, some of us might join hands and form some sort of organization to train young people. Mm -hmm. but, but there's a terrible lack, and I, 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 and I do want anybody who's listening to me in these southwest states or wherever we're going, these lovely young girls who have talent to do anything they can come to come to see me. <laughs> <laughs> the pretty ones. We have uh, several scenes from your new film, and this first sequence features Jack Lemmon, the mugger. Does this need any setting up? Uh, it's it's that Jack Lemmon has just discovered that uh, uh, the, the, the the one of the sources of his neurosis, which is his inability to fight back. He never fought back. He had an older brother uh, and, and with whom he had a sibling relationship, but the brother became the bread earner of the family and, became, was, and really took over as the father. 
And so he never fought back to the brother. He never fought back to anybody, and he's just discovered that. And that's why he's on an analyst's couch at this particular moment. Having just discovered that fact, he walks down the street, and he is abruptly bumped into by a young, tough kid. As the kid goes away, he reaches, and he finds that his wallet is gone. And so, I don't know where you're starting, but if you're starting somewhere around here, you'll know what these, this is exactly the situation where he takes off after that kid, absolutely determined to get that wallet back. Here's a scene right now from Mel Frank's film of Neil Simon's Prisoner of Second Avenue. <laughs> A scene from Melvin Frank's film, Prisoner of Second Avenue. For those in the audience who have not seen the film or did not see the play on stage, would you tell them a little bit about the story? Absolutely. Uh, the Prisoner of Second Avenue is based actually on, an, on a real character. It was Neil Simon's uncle, a man who uh, became expendable to the social, the, to, 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 to the business world in which we live, our economic struggle a, a battle a mm -hmm. bit too soon. Uh, Jack Lemon plays a man who's 48 years old and who is fired from his job with very little notice. Unfortunately, this is happening today all over the world. And um, Jack is, plays the part of a man who has a wife who is enormously sympathetic and who slowly, slowly, be, he is one who, who slowly disintegrates. She, she goes out to work, she goes back, takes her old job back. I mean, this doesn't sound like a terribly funny premise. I'm really telling you the part about it that, that's real. But this is really what it's about. It's, he, he's plagued, of course, and uh, we tried not to make this too funny. We tried to make it too real, but no matter what we did, people laugh at it. Mm -hmm. The more we underplayed it, the funnier it seemed to get to people in, in the theaters until they really do laugh at the fact that when he gets angry, he pounds the wall, it cracks, that the toilets don't flush, that there are difficulties uh, with two airline stewardesses next door who keep dragging home athletes, and God knows what goes on in that <laughs> apartment next door. He says, well, you know, it doesn't mean whether you're a basketball player or a football player. He says, nobody loses when they wind up in there <laughs> uh, late at night. Um, this is all part and parcel of the, of, of the pressures and the anxieties that are put upon this man, this very decent man who's been with the company for 22 years and has suddenly let go. Um, incidentally, we hope that because this is a very general situation today, that it's happening to all too many people, that uh, that people who come to see the picture will will hopefully not feel as lonely and alone. There's a terrible aloneness about being fired. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't realize that it's happening to a lot of other people because there's no way, unless you're in a union or something like that, so for people to get together. But when you're a white collar worker, when you're making twenty-five, thirty, or forty thousand dollars a year and suddenly let out of that job, you're very, very much alone, and as the unemployment continues, and as you have to, there's a scene where Jack has to go to the unemployment office, yeah. for instance. That was done with a certain amount of satire. How a man who, the, who, who, who never would dream of getting help for uh, his economic now goes to unemployment. Same thing as people drive up in Cadillacs often in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Actors who are out of work go up and pick up their checks. And their, so there is that element in in the picture. We try to show that, and. Uh, it develops to a point where he eventually does go through a sort of psychic experience of, of which can only be called, I suppose, a nervous breakdown. Mm -hmm. Now, it would be wrong to say that everybody who's going to go out of work or who lost his job is going to have a nervous breakdown. That's not what we mean. And were this a more serious picture, we'd probably go into the roots of why it was that he had it. But it's not important to us. The important thing for us to deal with are some of the comedic aspects. Again, with the hope that the people who go to see Prisoner of Second Avenue will go home saying, oh, yeah, that, I recognize that. That's real. That's funny because it's happened to me or my mm -hmm. uncle or my brother or my, or my cousin. And I'll be a little less anxious and feel a little less alone tonight and perhaps sleep just a little bit better mm -hmm. tonight. So go, go to see the picture and you'll sleep better. <laughs> but I hope not during it. Uh, well, since, uh, no. Go ahead. Go right ahead. Well, since you have been involved with comedy as long as you have, do you think then the best comedy stems from what happens in everyday life? I personally do, but on that, it depends on what sort of comedy that yeah. you want. You know, uh, uh, we started out closely associated with a guy who's pretty well known in this particular town. Um, in fact, that during the American Film Festival, we ran pic our pictures in a theater known as the Bob Hope Theater. And um, I assume that Bob 
had something to do with his being called. Well, I, I, <laughs> Bob or his checkbook had something to do, to do with it, I would think. But it was Bob Hope who gave my partner and me our first job. I first started out as a as a gag writer to a young fellow who was then completely unknown, named Bob Hope, who was 36 years old or 37 years old. My partner, right? partner was Norman Panama. Right. We were two kids from the University of Chicago. Drove right through here, by the way, and didn't stop long, just for lunch, and went right on out to California and got into it. Uh, but uh, uh, as I say, we started with Bob Hope, and I'm only telling, I'm not going to give you the story of my life, but I'm merely saying that in doing that, we did some of the road pictures, mm -hmm. the road to Utopia, the road to Hong Kong. And we did a lot of things like Monsieur Bouquet and uh, White Christmas and uh, lighter things. And then we went into Danny Kay pictures and some Cary Grant pictures. And mostly the, uh, the comedy was broader and situational, and the emphasis was more upon uh, what would happen if somebody goes through that door and comes out here, from both, rather than... Uh, really and truly the characters and character development and character growth and things of that sort. Slowly I developed with character growth, I think, or, or with technique growth, into an ability to take that, th those techniques and apply comedy to more serious themes. And that first came through in a picture called The Facts of Life, which mm -hmm. Bob Hope did with Lucille Ball. Mm -hmm. And then in a picture that I did a few years ago called Bonus Era Mrs. Campbell. Again, that happened. And then, best of all, was in the last two pictures, which is A Touch of Class and uh, The Prisoner of Second Avenue. In both cases, I think there's been a sort of growth, at least I hope there's been mm -hmm. growth, mm -hmm. and myself as a maker of film, to deal with grown-up people, actor-wise grown-up people. I, I'm not saying that Bob hasn't grown. Bob, of course, has. But Bob Hope is essentially the same guy that he was years ago. He's brilliant, marvelous, mm -hmm. masterful in what he does. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking mm -hmm. about the fact that uh, a lot of us involved in this thing grew from being just neophyte uh, writers, actors, and so on, into people who could deal with really serious material, mm -hmm. get into it, could cope with with the with, with the nuances of of, the, of anxiety and yeah. uh, how those things apply to everyday life, and to talk about extracurricular marital activities in a in a way which was absolutely, hopefully, truthfully real, so that our big audience was not just the men, although I'm afraid it was written, some of our women liberation friends might say it was written, I'm touching now about it. I keep talking about A Touch of Class <laughs> and The Prisoner of Second Avenue, because yeah. I love them both so much, yeah. and touch of, A Touch of Class is coming out again, and I, I, I'm, I'm just going to run from one theater to another and keep looking at them, because every time I see these pictures, and I'm the guy that directed them, I see actors do something that I hadn't seen them do before, and I stood right there and watched them do it. Mm -hmm. I stood there watching them do it, and I tell you that there are things that Jack Lemmon does in The Prisoner of Second Avenue and Anne Bancroft does that I see that are a little bit different in every performance. Mm -hmm. I said, well, because at one time I'm, I'm watching the eyes. First time, first time I see a picture that I've made, I'm listening to see that the words are all there. And then I begin watching the people. Then I see things with their hands and things with their... I, I mean, there's a part where Jack is out on the on that balcony mm -hmm. where he gets hit with water and toward the very end. Do you remember that, yeah. that part where he, they, they, the people keep throwing a bucket of cold water on him when they don't like the way he's <laughs> making some noise because he's really yelled to the whole city of New York out there. And But there's a time, the last time he does it, and he, there where he goes, and finally he just looks up at that woman and he just goes... And then his fingers go like this, just for a sec, which are brilliant. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's Laurel and Hardy and W.C. Fields, and it's all the great comedians wrapped right up into one. <laughs> really and truly, that he does with that one little gesture with his hand. And yet, your heart could break for him. And he's, he's still, see, he, we call him the grapefruit. We call him a, a lot of things, Jack. He calls himself the human hinge because he can turn so <laughs> on a gauss wing. But uh, he is, his, his is, to me, Jack Lemmon's face is the face of humanity. Mm -hmm. It is the face of every man. It's the face of the little guy who, 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 who is always beset, but somehow or other is going to come through. And he, excuse me, I just want to say one thing. Whether I'm part of it or not, he has the ability to make one of the great, great contributions in the history of film mm -hmm. because he has this incredible range. And he won the Academy last board last year for uh, uh, Save the Tiger. But I love the fact that, that 
in our review in the Los Angeles Times by a very, very good critic named Charles Champlin. Mm -hmm. He says this is a more important picture, and Jack does more things in this picture than he did in Save the Tiger. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm thrilled about, the, his performance and her performance. She, when I start talking about her, I'll go into ecstasies all over your screen. You know, there's another question I want to ask you, but before that, we do have another scene from Prisoner of Second Avenue. Does this need any setting up? Yes, I think I think it does, Jim. I think it's important that the audience knows that uh, I think that we've seen the fact that we come back uh, that Annie has gone on a little shopping shopping uh, spell and has come back and found the uh, apartment in absolute shambles. There has been a robbery. Jack comes in, doesn't see it at first. They start an argument back and forth. As they, uh, the argument leads to the point at which Jack starts to get some pains in his chest, sits down. She says, what are you, why are you rubbing your stomach? He says, I'm not rubbing, I'm just holding it. What's the matter with you? And she says, why, why are you so upset? Because I've had, he says, because I've had a nervous breakdown. <coughs> Excuse me. And they didn't leave me with anything. They took my scotch, left me with a blank, blank golf hat. <laughs> and he rushes out onto the out on the terrace and starts to yell at New York in general, just yell and scream. We shot this right in New York. Uh, at the same time, a neighbor appears upstairs and says, haven't you got any respect for anybody? And Jack tells him in no uncertain terms who he has respect for, which is his backside. That's, <laughs> that's all anybody respects. And they go back and forth and back and forth, and finally as Jack looks up and yells at, and screams at him, the man lets go with a big bucket of water which falls right on Jack's face. Uh, and then there's a rather sensitive scene that follows that. That should pretty well cover what you're about to see. Here's another scene from Mel Frank's film, Prisoner of Second Avenue. A scene from Prisoner of Second Avenue, starring Jack Lemmon and Anne Bancroft. You have been talking about how marvelously people such as Glenda Jackson, George Siegel, Jack Lemmon uh, play this material. But how would the same material, or similar material, let's say, be in less gifted hands? You have, you have been extraordinarily successful with comedy, as has Jack Lemmon, as has Neil Simon. Now, is this material funny in itself, or is it the way these people see the material that makes it funny? That, that's a hard question to ask. Uh, I mean, it's a hard question to answer, let me put it that way. Uh, it, I can only judge it from my own personal experience. Mm -hmm. But I have had plays, for instance, Broadway plays, which I felt had to have those particular people in it, the people mm -hmm. who did it. And yet, years later, a play like Little Abner uh, goes on the road, and it's done in churches and in and in uh, schools and all over the world all the time. We get a big healthy check out of it every year. I, I, my, my, my share isn't that much, but it's split up between all the creators. But, and so when I run into people and they, now and they say, oh, you, I, I know your work because I played Mary and Sam in my high school and another lady said I played Daisy May in college and so on and so forth. So that must have worked. It must yeah. have been all right. But... Um, yeah, I think we could have done this with other people. I think it might have been pretty good. I, I, I would like to think that the material is universal. I'm thrilled mm -hmm. over the people who did do it, but I don't think they're the only people who could have done it. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I think they're the only pe I must say that they're the only people who could have done it, from my point of view, as well as they did it. Mm -hmm. I think I'm, there are other people who, uh, had I been forced to make the, make the picture with other people, I would have made it, but it might not have worked as well. I'm, what I'm saying is there are some people <laughs> with whom I could not have worked yeah. and who could never have done this material this way. There are others who might have done it as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, am I, sure. I'm trying to be honest yeah. as far as everybody's concerned. But the people who did do it were, in my opinion, the very, very best people alive today yeah. to have done this material. It's just hard for me to think of, of the same film being done directed by a magnificent director, though he may be uh, Stanley Kubrick, starring Marlon Brando, for example. You know, they're brilliant talents, but it's hard for me to see them doing that kind of film. Well, you'd so be surprised. Brando could have done it, but I don't think Kubrick could have done it. <laughs> I, I don't mean that. I'm, just like I can't do some of the Kubrick films. Yeah. I don't think yeah. we think of them on the same lines yeah. at all. I, I, I know Stanley. We both lived in London, and, lived, and I think I'm highly respectful of him. But this isn't his bag, and Clockwork Orange isn't mine. Yeah. I wish I had the money that I made. <laughs> 
We have a, I suppose, a series of bloopers from Prisoner of Second Avenue. What can you tell us about these? Well, well I, the main thing I can tell you is that, uh, uh, in a sense, this is the most real comedy of all because it's absolutely unexpected. By bloopers, we mean those scenes in which the people blew up. That's where they get the word blooper, blew up. And uh, where they said the wrong words, they would made the wrong actions, and sometimes went into a bit of profanity or whatever it might have been. And uh, I, I always print those when people, when the, the ones that amuse me, because they are hilarious sometimes. Uh, <laughs> one time, I must tell you, uh, on A Touch of Class, uh, they were doing that intimate love scene. And I thought I had said cut. They were doing something wrong. And I thought I said cut, but I hadn't, apparently. I said it to myself. And I said, I must have whispered it. <laughs> Nobody heard it. They went on act. And I was assured that the cameras had stopped. You know, and I walked in. And right in the middle of the scene, George looked up and said, hey, what's the fat fellow doing here? He says, who's this fat guy? What's he doing in here? <laughs> apparently, I forgot to say cut and walked into the thing. Anyway, the ones you're about to see are the various scenes in the pictures in which either Jack or Annie or Gene Sachs forgot what to say, looked at each other and went blank, went dry, as the actors mm -hmm. say, or said the wrong thing. Okay. Here are scenes you won't see in the finished film, Prisoner of Second Avenue. Outtakes from Prisoner of Second Avenue, the new Mel Frank film. As you said, Touch of Class uh, has just been reissued around the country. Did you anticipate this film's success? It was, it really was a tremendous success, winning all kinds of awards. Did you think it would be that successful? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't think it would be that successful. I thought it might be a success. Uh, I had no idea that Glenda Jackson would win the Academy Award. Mm -hmm. I don't think she, I think nobody was more surprised than <laughs> she. I, of course, had to accept the award. The most terrifying moment of my life was when I had to get up there in front of 80 million people and say something <laughs> unexpectedly. I know what I wish I, I, you know, what I wanted to say, but I, I, you always think about things that you want to say afterwards. Yeah. But and then I didn't have any idea that there was that many people looking. I didn't know that 80 million people saw me standing up there stuttering and stammering or saying something that I thought was cute and actually getting a laugh, which I, <laughs> which I did do up there that night. Uh, but uh, I, I just think that in, in retrospect, the reason that it's, that it's a success is that there are so many people that can identify with it. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's also been enormously successful in its re-release is that, uh, it's, it, as somebody said an interesting thing to me the other day, said, you know, I saw the picture. It, it had been on, a, a, uh, on cable television in Los Angeles, and it ran for a whole week, and the guy said, listen, the thing that I liked about that picture is I tuned it in at certain different times. Now, I'd seen the picture three times, he said. But nonetheless, whenever I tuned it in, whatever that scene was, was in itself interesting and good and exciting. That's right. And, th and th th I think that's the reason for its success. I think wherever you look at it and whatever you're, you're seeing two people, I mean, I, I, I sound like a, a terribly conceited man. I don't mean to be because I've had some ter terrible dogs, too. So you, I can look at Melvin Frank objectively and say, well, you've got three hats, writer, producer, director, maybe you should take one hat off now and then. But in that particular case, he had his three hats on, and they all fit. They all work. They, they, sometimes things just fall together, and they do. It's like, you know, you, you, you hear a, a golfer finish a golf uh, uh, round and say, uh, gee, I, I played well today, you know. Well, you think he's got three, but what he means is he played so lousy so many times. But that particular round was good. Well, on that picture, I played well. It, it, we all did. It, it worked. And the same thing can be said of, of, of Prisoner of Second Avenue. Mm -hmm. It worked. The, we all swung well. We had a good round. Yeah. We are unfortunately just about out of time. I want to thank you very much for taking this time here at the USA Film Festival and come to Atlanta and see us. Jim, I'll be delighted to do that. Thank you, Mel Frank. Thank you. My thanks to all of you for watching this week. Join me again next time. For now, good night.